Good evening. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this virtual launch of The Neglected C.S. Lewis by Mark Neal and Jerry Root. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us. A recording of today's conversation will be available for two weeks to share with anyone who couldn't join us. And we'll also let you know how to get your copy of The Neglected C.S. Lewis. Please take a moment now to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and feel free to submit any questions you may have for Mark and Jerry throughout the conversation, and we'll hope to get to everyone at the end. Now, by way of introduction, Mark Neal is the co-author of both The Neglected C.S. Lewis and The Surprising Imagination of C.S. Lewis. He has lectured, taught, and published nationally and internationally on Lewis for the last 10 years. He works as the VP of a Chicago area marketing firm and is married with two children. Dr. Jerry Root is an associate professor at Wheaton College, a visiting professor at Biola University and Talbot Graduate School of Theology in La Mirada, California. Jerry has written many books centered around the teachings of C.S. Lewis. He has lectured on C.S. Lewis at 48 college or university campuses in 11 countries. He has taught college and graduate courses on C.S. Lewis for 30 consecutive years. Jerry and his wife, Claudia, have four married children four grandchildren and a Welsh corgi, and they live in Wheaton, Illinois. Welcome, Jerry and Mark. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who um, took the time to attend and uh, be part of this launch. We're, we're grateful for your presence here. Um, we wanted to just take a, a, a moment by way of introduction to kind of explain why we wrote the book and why we chose the title The Neglected C.S. Lewis. You know, most people who think about C.S. Lewis don't think he's neglected. You know, he's written The Chronicles of Narnia, which were made into feature films. He's written The Screwtape Letters, Mere Christianity, things that, you know, everyone is familiar with. But what a lot of people either don't remember or don't know is that Lewis's primary job was as a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature at both Oxford and Cambridge universities. So he has a whole body of literary critical and scholarly work on these subjects that a lot of people just don't know about. And so um, what we are trying to do is, is rehabilitate these works a little bit. And Lewis himself um, did that for other authors. Um, he would um, write essays and, and so forth on authors for which he felt um, there was some sort of lack of critical appreciation and so forth. And he called that rehabilitation. And so we're kind of doing for Lewis what he did for others and rehabilitating these works, bringing them back into kind of the forefront of people's um, um, uh, perspective so that uh, people become aware of these books and begin to read them. Because really, I think we kind of agree that many of his best ideas are found in these books, ideas that um, kind of begin in seed format here and then work their way into his more mainstream works. And really, um, uh, we would also say, I think that you can't know Lewis fully if you don't know his literary critical works, if you don't know this body of work. I mean, he was a very preoccupied with these, with these works of literature from these different periods and were greatly influential on him. So to really know Lewis fully, you need to know these works as well. And I think um, just by way of, of uh, talking about how Lewis himself saw a study of the past and of these scholarly works of um, Renaissance and medieval literature, for him, um, reading old works of literature helped to avoid what he called chronological snobbery. And chronological snobbery is really valuing our own age um, in a way that kind of degrades or denies the validity of other ages. And so Lewis was, was really um, kind of insistent that we not do that and that the study of old works of literature would help us uh, to, to engage in a different way of thinking about these things. So as we move forward in this talk, um, we're just gonna kind of go back and forth. Um, the book uh, looks at eight different works of Lewis's um, literary criticism. I think we've identified about 16. We don't cover them all in the book, but we do cover eight of them. So right now we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth and give you a very brief overview um, of each of these books that we cover in the work and some of the main ideas associated with those books. So I'll, I'll punt over to Jerry and he can start. The first book I'd like to talk about is the um, 
The Allegory of Love. This was a book that came out in 1936, and it is a book that established Lewis's reputation as a great medieval literary critic. Um, he says at the very beginning of that book that humanity does not pass through phases as a train passes through stations. Being alive, it has the privilege of always moving, yet never leaving anything behind. And with that understanding, Lewis then begins to see continuity and change throughout medieval literature, particularly looking at what he calls the love allegory. And the allegory of love traces this development, the medieval ideal of love, and it moves from adultery to the Christian concept of marriage, which is fidelity and in proper relationship. He seeks, he sees that the Middle Ages employed uh, allegory also to speak of the interior life, the life of the spirit, the life of the affections, and so on. Why? Well, if you look at the word definition, it means of the finite. We define things by their limitation and function. Something has to be small enough to wrap words around it in order to distinguish it from other things. How do you talk about God? If he's infinite, he breaks the category. So we use uh, figures of speech. We use metaphors, similes. Jesus used parables. He said the kingdom of heaven is like. So we can get our imaginative eye focused on these things, even if we can't reduce it to mere definition. Allegory was the means of talking about the interior life, the spiritual life, and so on. But why adultery? This is the crazy thing. Well, in the medieval concept of courtly love, Courtly love would be the love that you saw in the court, in the palaces. This is the leisured classes. You had humility, which was the uh, way we would be before the beloved. You had courtesy, the expression of my life for you to the beloved. There would be the religion of love, which was devotion to the beloved. But also there was adultery because marriages were arranged in those days. You ended up not marrying the person you really loved. And consequently, these trysts would occur. And it was often traced in the in the uh, love illusions in scripture in, in this in this literature, but Lewis traces this development, and he begins to talk about how in medieval literature there's embellishment. Um, an old author, an author would take old material and embellishment embellish it along lines of something he wanted to communicate. It's not unlike what we do today. If you see, oh brother, where art thou? It's an embellishment of Homer's. Uh, Ulysses. If you see uh, Bridget Jones' diary, it's an embellishment of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. If you see um, uh, August Rush, and it's an embellishment of Dickens' um, 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 Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> and and you see these embellishments in our literature, but they did it in those days as well. And so, consequently, Lewis looks at how this embellishment develops, and he looks first early on at Romance of the Rose. And here's a man who's a, a courtier who has his, as an object of devotion, the young woman, and he pursues her in the hopes of deflowering her. He knows what he does is wrong and he feels guilty about it. This guilt is something. It sees that this, this idea of adultery is not appropriate. Then Lewis moves from there. These are some select books that he looks at. He moves from there to uh, Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida. It's one of the best books I've ever read. And, and Troilus and Cressida, Troilus is a, is a man who has this, this uh, love interest. It's unrequited. Eventually, it's responded to, and then eventually his heart is broken by Cressida. Chaucer begins the book by asking for the reader to pray for him. This is different, that he would tell the story well. He asks that prayers might be made for those who have never been in love. He asks that prayers might be made for those who are unrequited in love. He asks prayers be made for those who are in love that they remain in love, or if their hearts are broken in love, that their hearts would mend. As he tells his story, when he finishes it, he begins with another prayer or ends with another prayer. Blessed Jesus, turn all our loves to thee. This is a major movement in the whole trajectory of the love allegory in medieval literature. We come, though, ultimately, after going through several other books, to Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, which Lewis thought was the archetype of the uh, demonstration of the preference of Christian marriage over what had come before. And, and the whole book is full of marriages. And, and um, it was a very popular work. Lewis says it follows in the style of the Italian epic. 
the only way I can describe it, you've got a, an adventure that comes on here, then something breaks in, another adventure goes over here, another adventure. It would be like an Indiana Jones movie, very popular. But the idea then that was carried, the height of Christian marriage guarded and protected by virtue and temperance and proper devotion and justice rendering to another their due. The book is very significant in our era, in an age where marriage is under siege, this book is both timely and helpful. Well, another book that we look at um, in our work is uh, Studies in Words. And Studies in Words is published in 1960, originally a series of lectures given to students at Oxford. And Lewis writes in this book that his purpose in writing it is to facilitate a more accurate reading of old books. And why is this important? Why should old books, the reading of old books, and our understanding of them be important? Well, Lewis would say it helps to correct the characteristic mistakes and blindnesses of our own period. And he has this great quote in there. And he says, the only palliative to this situation is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And this can only be done by reading old books. And in this particular work, uh, work, Lewis looks at 10 different words and he kind of traces their meaning change over time and, and how these words have changed. And, and, and Lewis says that um, if we don't take the time to, to accurately understand what a word meant when an author wrote it, then we're misreading that work and bringing our own conception and our own worldview to bear on it. Um, there's a great little example that I can kind of illustrate this with. Um, a while ago, I was shopping at a bookstore and came across a copy of Rudyard Kipling's uh, stories. And for those of you who don't know who Rudyard Kipling was, he was an English uh, author, lived in India for a time, probably most famous for his Jungle Book stories. But uh, I didn't think much about it, put it on my shelf. And a few years later, I happened to pull it off. And I noticed on the cover, there was a little embossed seal and it was an elephant with a lotus uh, flower in its trunk. But next to it was a picture of a swastika. And I looked at that and I thought, is, is, is Kipling like, you know, a, a, a pro-Nazi here or what? And in that moment, Kipling might have been lost to me forever because of my understanding and identification with that symbol. But I did a little bit of research. And what I found is that swastika is actually an ancient Eastern religious symbol that's been around for thousands of years. And Kipling was using it in a completely different way before the Nazis had ever appropriated that symbol for their regime. In fact, in later editions of his books, Kipling made sure that that was removed. But it illustrates the point that this symbol kind of swallowed up every other meaning that could possibly be there. And if I hadn't done my research, if I hadn't gone back to take a look at what Kipling really meant by that, then I could have lost the benefit of reading his works you know, for good. And I think this is what Lewis is telling us can happen if we don't take the time to read old works of literature in this way, to study, to find the meanings of those, of the original meanings of those words such that we can read it accurately as the author of the time intended it. Um, also, if you're, if you're in any way engaged in Bible interpretation, these works of literary criticism will help you as you see how Lewis was able to rivet his attention to a text and draw as much out of it as possible. And it embodies the kinds of things that exegetes should be doing or people who study scripture. The next one I want to talk about is the Arthurian Torso. And the occasion of this book, C.S. Lewis's dear friend, fellow inkling with J.R.R. Tolkien's home was Charles Williams. Charles Williams had written poetry on the Arthurian legend, and he told it through the, the eyes of the poet of Camelot, who was Taliesin. And, and the, the poetry is rather obtuse, but there is brilliant, brilliant thought and, and creative theological thinking in the work. And when Williams died prematurely, Lewis felt an obligation to his dear friend to help people see in this book its significance. And so he wrote a literary criticism of his friend's work. Um, again, there are big ideas that Williams borrowed and embellished in this book as well. And I just want to talk about a couple of those. Uh, several places, uh, Williams will say that we could say of anything that we see in our world, this also is thou. God is present in this thing. But we'd have to say, neither is that thou, lest we become idolaters. 
caught in these two phrases are the concepts of God's imminence, his presence in things. We could talk about the cataphatic coming down into things, but then also the apophatic, the transcendent, that God is greater than the things that we see. And two big areas of worship grew out of this. Lewis builds on this in this work. One is the, is the way that prays with eyes closed, shuts out all distractions, says of everything in this world, neither is this thou. And the other is the way that prays with eyes wide open, so that everything becomes a call to worship. And these are the more high liturgical forms of worship that have church colors, they have smells, they have sounds in the, in, in the services and everything. Everything alerts us to it. Both of these can go awry with, with the, the uh, uh, apophatic, closing the eyes and so on. It could lead to legalism, like the first time you're at dinner and somebody, one of the kids at the table says, Mommy, Johnny didn't have his eyes closed when we prayed. And all of a sudden, the first legalist is born. Or the uh, cataphatic, looking at these particular objects that awaken me to worship, they can begin to become the objects of worship and it can lead to idolatry. The antidote to both is some involvement with the other. And Jesus said, you know, John came neither eating nor, nor drinking. And they said he was a crazy man. And Jesus said the son of man came both eating and drinking. And they said he had wine bibber and a and, and a, a friend of sinners. And Jesus says, wisdom is vindicated by our children. Same concept in Williams here. And then also, um, he borrows from the Demonarchia by Dante. And in the Demonarchia, there's this line um, where uh, Dante says that, that function precedes essence. God's purposes for us preceded his, his making us. In, in other words, uh, if you go to the creation account in Genesis 1, God made light on day one, but he doesn't make the luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars, the essences to emit light till day four. And what, what, what Williams is trying to point out here is that God had purposes for us, and he gave us what we needed to fulfill those purposes. We could spend our lives looking at somebody else and say, how come I'm not like that person, and miss out on the very delight that God had when he created us. William says the fall was an alteration in knowledge. Lewis repeats it in this book. What did he mean by that? Well, we see it when King Arthur, in William's uh, uh, rendition, stands over the rampart of Camelot and looks out and says, does the king exist for the kingdom? My function is that I should serve them. Or does the kingdom exist for me? In other words, he put essence ahead of purpose. And all of Camelot unravels at that point. Well, we see the same concept in Lewis, when Jadis, queen of Charn, the white, who will become the white witch of Narnia, learns by, by uh, magical arts to say the deplorable word where she saves herself and destroys her world. And she violates nature at that point. She becomes anti oslan certainly anti-Christ. These ideas are embedded in this book. There's many, many more I wish I could talk about, but some of them even related to the longings. Uh, um, uh, Taliesin, the poet, longs for the ideal society. And yet he sees that his world is broken. And, and this also creates this longing to have things in us fixed. It's brilliant stuff. Another work that we uh, uh, take a look at in the book is an experiment in criticism. And, and Lewis wrote this book to turn the dominant literary criticism of his own day on its head. And that, that literary criticism was very evaluative. It was employed in judging the content of books. And what Lewis wanted to understand is if it was possible to divine a good book as one that was read in a specific way and a bad book as one that was read in a different way. And so he divides readers into a couple different categories. First is the category of the few. These are people who appreciate reading. Um, their reading changes their consciousness. They reread books over and over again. They return to them because they're enriched by them. There's also the category of the many. These are the folks that, that never really read anything twice. They read the sort of accepted works of the day or the popular works of the day. They're not changed by what they read and reading isn't valued um, for what it can give them. And I think Lewis's big idea in this book is that reading gives us a unique experience. It gives us windows that we can then see out of that enlarge our views and widen our horizons in a way that other things maybe can't. Um, 
he has a great quote at the end of the book. He says, I need others' eyes. I would see with others' eyes. My own eyes are not enough for me. Um, I, uh, even that's not enough. I would see what others have imagined. Even that's not enough. I regret that the brutes can't write books. You know, gladly would I see how reality is perceived uh, to the eye of a bee or a mouse or how it comes charged to the olfactory sense of a dog. And Lewis says we live in a very narrow prison of self and so we need others eyes, we need other viewpoints. We need these windows out of which to look so that our own narrow horizons may be widened and, and then we can experience growth and transformation. Um, this is, can be a very difficult thing to achieve in, in the current culture. You know, we live in very fast paced lives in a very frenetic kind of culture. Um, there's a loss of silence. There's a loss of wisdom and solitude, the sorts of things that would be required in order for us to read in this way and, and to gain these, these, these clear, clear views through these windows. And, and I think in many ways, our windows have been darkened by, by much of what goes on in culture today. But again, Lewis is adamant that reading gives us these windows. And you know, if we can't look out of these windows, then we tend to fall back into self-referentialism. And so we see the world through our own eyes and clearly that's not, not beneficial. Um, Chesterton has an interesting quote. Uh, he writes in, in his work of fiction, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, that um, there's a law written in the darkest of the books of life and it is this, if you look at a thing, 999 times you're perfectly safe. If you look at it for the thousandth time, you're in frightful danger of seeing it for the first time. And I think this is the very thing that Lewis is calling us to do, to, to look out of these windows, to see reality for what it is and to widen our, our views and our landscapes as a result. And I think good reading uh, gives this to us and that's what Lewis would argue for sure in this book. The next one I wanna talk about is the personal heresy it's also a very early literary critical work of Lewis's, where he goes toe to toe in debate with the master of Jesus College, Cambridge, E.M.W. Tilliard. Tilliard was a great Milton scholar. And in his work on Milton, he made this comment that what Milton is, uh, Paradise Lost is really all about is the state of the author's mind when he wrote the book. Well, Lewis took exception to this. And so consequently, he wrote a, a criticism of the book in a, an annual that comes out from the Oxford University um, uh, English faculty called Essays and Studies. And he took to task Tilliard. And, and he writes, you know, when you're looking at a book, if you start to think you have to focus on the state of the author's mind, it, it's going to be something completely in your imagination. We don't have the author's mind there. We have the text. We can look at the text. Then he said, the one thing you can't see when you're reading what an author writes about is the author, because you're looking through his eyes. You're using the author as spectacles. You don't make a spectacle of the author. And Lewis was saying, if, if, if you were going to do this, what, what, what would you do with a play where you've got several different people's perspectives and the different characters? Which one represents the author? You make a muddle of trying to interpret these things. So it gets back a little bit to what Mark was saying earlier. We don't want to be self-referential. We don't want to project on a text. We want to see what the text is actually saying. And then also, uh, Lewis said, we don't really know much about who wrote Beowulf. And there might have been other people who contributed to its development. So whose author's mind are you going to try and look at in, in that situation? So Lewis disagreed with him. And the next year in Essays and Studies, Tilliard responded to Lewis. And the next year, Lewis responded to, uh, I think we're, we're not connected maybe. Yeah. The next year, uh, Lewis responded to um, Tilliard. And they decided that this debate was so good that they were going to have a, uh, have a, uh, uh, make a book out of it. And so it goes back and forth. Now, the thing that's great about this book is that these two are very, very capable debaters. There are no, there's no evidence of informal fallacies in this thing. There's no evidence of uh, an ad hominem argument, a straw man argument. It is a debate that produces light, not heat. Why is this important for us? Because it embodies what we need in our day when polarization has gripped our culture. You, you can't have people engage in debates anymore. They begin with the assumption the other person's all messed up. 
rather than saying, well, this is another person. I respect him. What does he have to say? And here's what I have to say. And let's see how we can then hone our thinking corporately rather than just reject one another out of hand. This is a brilliant, brilliant book, The Personal Heresy. One of my favorite Lewis books is um, The Discarded Image. And it's really a guidebook, I think, that Lewis wrote. Again, um, you know, he says in, in the book that he wrote the book um, to provide people with a way to accurately read medieval and Renaissance literature. Um, is originally published in 64 as a series of lectures um, given to Oxford students, again, as many of his works were. Um, but it, it's, it's a wonderful book. It, it gives a, a very detailed account of the medieval cosmology and worldview of the heavens, of the earth, of the human soul, and so forth. And Lewis goes into great detail about this. It's very rich. Um, but interestingly, I think Lewis's main contribution in the book is, is how we understand models in general. Um, he makes the point that all models are provisional until new data comes along. And he says that each age has to account for the facts, but he warns that we're not to idolize any particular worldview over any other um, because our current model will always be superseded at some point and therefore become a discarded image. And I really think that um, reading this book especially helps us to understand Lewis in a way maybe that we haven't before. Um, he was preoccupied with this medieval model. He, he, he was delighted in its uh, imaginative significance and richness. And in fact, um, you know, anyone who's read the Chronicles of Narnia or the Ransom Trilogy, by which I mean, you know, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength, um, should really go back and read this book. You'll come to uh, read those books when you read them again with a whole new level of appreciation because Lewis infused those works with this medieval cos cosmology. And many people don't realize that, um, but to, to read these books enriches the experience of reading those other books. And it's just, it's a wonderful book. And, and he also reminds us that our own age will be a discarded image. Yeah. So consequently, we, we can't see the errors of our day clearly. We can look back a hundred years or 200 years or 300 years and we can be critics uh, Monday morning quarterbacks about that time, but but we can't see the things that are so proximate and clear, and we can't fast forward 100 or 200 years to look back crit critically at this time. But you can read the past, and you can make comparative judgments between today and the past, and while the past had their errors, they didn't necessarily have the same ones we had. So the discarded image is an extremely helpful book. But the next one I want to talk about is English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama. What a title. It's about a 700 page book. And as Michael Ward observed in his uh, endorsement of our book, he said, Lewis had said that this magnum opus, this important book that he wrote, all his other books while he was writing this were just the twiddly bits. And that would have included Mere Christianity. It would have included the Narnian Chronicles, Screw Tape Letters. Lewis called those as twiddly bits compared to this book. And it's a massive work. To write it, Lewis read every book written in the 16th century in English. He read every book translated into English in the original language it was written, Old English, Italian, French, whatever, and also in Latin, and also read it in translation and read it in the original so his judgments would be fair-minded. It's a massive work of scholarship. And, and as you read it, you see such winsomeness in Lewis. He, he comments on all these authors, and you kind of laugh your way through it. But you also see such perceptivity, such clarity, and so on. Um, he begins it by talking about new, in that century, new learning and new ignorance. It was a century where science and astronomy was moving us from a Earth-centered cosmology to a solar-centered cosmology. Major shift. It was a time when geography was awakening in the sense that the Western Hemisphere had been discovered. And consequently, it was an age of exploration and eventual exploitation. And also, religion was in a time of, of upheaval. It was a time of the Reformation. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to me. Um, Lewis, who read completely both sides of the Reformation, has more nuanced judgments about that time and, and more refrained in his judgments because he's more informed. He said that the Roman Catholics thought that the Protestants were all antinomians. And the Protestants thought the Catholics were all Pelagian. 
Well, you could find Pelagian and antinomians in those two groups, but that was not typical of those groups. And consequently, Lewis is able to say both were wrong. They read the worst examples of the other side and didn't treat the other side with the, with the clarity that they should have. This is interesting to me. Well, as a result of new ignorance from these projections and new learning, there were divisions between the old and new. Lewis says nothing in the history of thought exists like a shoreline in geography. And this minute I'm on the shore, this minute I'm in the water. Um, we talk about middle ages. No, no, nobody was running around in the, in the 15th and 16th century saying, I live in the middle ages. He says in another place, we don't know if the problems of our time are the problems of infancy or senility. We just know here's where we are. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, people started periodizing um, generalizing in such a way that they projected onto a body of literature that it had these qualities. Well, you can abstract, certainly, but if you are not careful about your abstraction, your abstraction becomes a lie. You've got to account for the exceptions. And so, so basically, this idea of chronological snobbery that Mark talked about then is this projection back on the past, and we begin to make judgments that are not founded. Lewis, however, does make classifications, however, in this book. He talks about the literature of the drab age and the literature of the golden age, all from that century. And, and what does he mean by it? The drab age literature was literature that failed to describe and define. It was telling the reader what he or she should feel rather than depicting something and let the reader respond appropriately themselves. They don't have to be coerced into this response. And he thought that the drab age literature was handcuffed by the Renaissance uh, um, demand of classical style, going back to old Greek and Roman style. And consequently, they took delight and pleasure and made it atrophy in this literature. On the other hand, the golden age literature, he felt was unencumbered by classical style. That didn't mean it didn't have form, but the form served the imagination. It didn't stifle the imagination. And he opens a door in this literature to wonder and awe. You'll discover there wonderful statements about Spencer, Sidney, uh, Michael Drayton. And he says in this work, virtue is lovely and not merely obligatory. And consequently, um, we see this glorious work. What are the benefits for today? The book is itself a liberal arts education. And Lewis said of Spencer, and I think it could also be said of Lewis, to read him is to grow in mental health. And I think that's true with English literature in the 16th century as well. Mm -hmm. uh, another work that we looked at is Lewis's book, Selected Literary Essays, um, published in 69. Um, meant most of the essays in this book were published elsewhere, but they were brought under common cover um, through the effort of Walter Hooper. Um, Lewis, again, as we've mentioned throughout this talk, is typically known as a medieval and Renaissance uh, literature scholar. But this book really shows that his literary interests were more far ranging. Um, <clears throat> there's essays on Shakespeare, there's essays on Jane Austen, on Kipling, on uh, Sir Walter Scott, on William Morris, and, and so forth. Um, and, and in this book, as I mentioned earlier, Lewis is actually engaging in rehabilitation and, and bringing some of these authors that had been neglected back into the people's attention because they really are very deserving authors um, and deserving of that attention and, and of people being uh, able to read them and so forth when they had been kind of uh, put, put, away, put aside or neglected. And in the very first essay that, that Lewis writes in the book called De Descriptioni Temporum, which means a description of the times, um, and it's his inaugural address to Cambridge University students, um, he writes that, that he is a guide and he acts as a translator of the past that his students can take advantage of. And this is a theme I think that we see throughout many of Lewis's books. It's this idea that he is acting as a guide for us so that we may look to the literature of other ages in a fresh way and with understanding rather than bringing our own worldview and modern conceptions to bear on it. Especially today um, when you know, the historical continuum is really um, under attack and, and being able to have that, that appropriate backward look um, to see that um, the past does inform the present and gives us perspective um, 
on our world. It's very important. There's a number of other essays in the book that are kind of all unrelated, but the, the first one kind of sets the tone, I think, for what Lewis is trying to achieve. I want to talk for a few minutes about some of Lewis's biggest ideas. And, and I want to relate them to these books that we've been talking about. So you'll see the big ideas in Lewis are pervasive, not just in his popular works of, of uh, theology or his popular works of fiction, his children's stories, science fiction, so on his novels. And, and, and one of the biggest ideas in Lewis is he's concerned to get people to see reality to break out of the dungeon of self and to see the world the way that it is. He, in a lecture to his Oxford University students in the 1930s said, we fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. In a book that Mark had talked about just a moment ago, Experiment Criticism in the epilogue, he has this statement, in coming to understand anything, we must reject the facts as they are for us in favor of the facts as they are. Reality is a plumb line to which we should adjust the scoliosis of our thinking, our souls, our moral life, our emotional life, our rational life, and so on. And so consequently, um, he is able to say at this point that he believes reality is infused with something of the presence of God. That if we look at the real world, something of the shadow of God is cast a, a, across it. And, and there's a place where Lewis says, uh, most of my books are evangelistic. What do you mean by that? We certainly would see how his apologetic books might be or his explicitly Christian books. But he says, we don't need more books by Christians about Christianity. We need more books by Christians on other topics with their Christianity latent. So consequently, he's presenting a whole Christian worldview in this literature. This is the real world he's calling us to attend to. And he sees it as he begins to describe for us uh, this medieval work in these great literary critical texts. Um, the next thing is that reality is iconoclastic. What does that mean? An iconoclast breaks idols. So I have an image of God. Maybe I read one of these Lewis books and some pieces of the puzzle came together for me. I heard a sermon. Uh, I, I had a late night talk with friends. Well, that image that begins to become more clear, if I hold on to it too tightly, it will compete against my having a growing understanding of God. And so the image once helpful now becomes an idol. And God in his mercy, Lewis says in one of his books, Surprised by Joy, is always kicking out the walls of temples we build for him because he wants to give us more of himself. The fact that reality is iconoclastic makes us then open to the challenges of any given day. Because we want to have our world not so tightly defined that we can't open up our imaginations to new discoveries that we, taking the truth we know, even the sure words we know, and plumb them more deeply, apply them more widely, and have them open up a door for us to wonder and awe. And then lastly, in these books, we see a theme that is so dominant in Lewis. It's a concept of longing. Uh, Lewis was haunted by longing. He describes it in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, but we could see how his attraction to these books also kindled this longing in him and the quest to find the object of his deepest longing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, ultimately, it would be a quest that would lead him to God. And, and, and I think it's also interesting that um, his, his literary works, in some senses, as it relates to longing, gives us a vocabulary for our own souls as we quest for a proper place, ultimate heaven, as we quest for a proper relationship, all our earthly relationships ultimately pointing us to God, and ultimately to for wholeness, that our brokenness that longs to be fixed can find its repair in the divine physician himself. And I think I'd we'd like to just close with some, some applications from these books that really are relevant to our time. There's going to be a little bit of crossover with some of the big ideas that Jerry talked about, but um, I'll dive into a little bit more depth on a few other things. Um, we've talked a little bit about the idea of um, the importance of avoiding chronological snobbery, that is projecting on the past something that was not there. Um, and, and looking down on the past and, and idolizing our own worldview as the one that's most prominent or more accurate, most accurate. Um, and so Lewis would say that we need to see the value of all uh, viewpoints um, and seeing the past as an interpreter of the present is going to be very important. Um, there's a, a great quote by Isaac Newton, and I think he says something to the effect that 
if I've seen further than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And G.K. Chesterton similarly says that, that man should be a prince on the pinnacle of a building built by his fathers, not a, a cad that's perpetually kicking down the ladders by which he climbed. And so Lewis also says that we need to use the historical imagination. That is, we need to to be able to inhabit the times that we read in, in these books in a way that enables us to recover modes of thought that were really long lost. And this is a very valuable sort of experience that reading can bring us. And it also, again, um, helps us to understand our present more clearly. Um, Lewis is, I think, um, especially the personal heresy provides a great model of civil debate um, and the, the debate between opposing viewpoints um, that Lewis had with Tilliard provided light and not heat, as, as Jerry uh, mentioned. And I think um, it, it's a great model for how civil debate should be. Um, I think in our culture, and especially as we see on, on social media, um, we're always seeing discussions that produce a lot of light, uh, sorry, a lot of heat, but no light. And, and I think Lewis gives us a, a great model for how we could do that better. One, one quick thing too, yeah, I sure. could add, Mark. Um, when when these two men went into that particular debate, they each made points and they could each concede points. If I can't go into a debate with a willingness to concede where somebody, my, my opponent, shows some error that I've embraced, then I'm, I'm never gonna grow. I'm going to be stuck in the vortex of my present understanding. I want right. more than that. Anyway, right. I'm sorry. No, that's good. Um, and I think Lewis, in, in many of his books, just provides a great model for good reading and scholarship. Um, the reading provides an experience that we can't get anywhere else. In another work, he says that we live a life of successive moments, right? One thing happens, then something else happens, then something else happens. And he says, in a life of these successive moments, we're always searching for something that is non-successive something where we will finally arrived and we find that as we have these different goalposts in life we get there and that thing that we wanted is still as far off as ever and i think the grass is greener mentality is a very deep habit of the contemporary mind and so i think reading developing the skill of reading um, provides a way for us to get close lewis says to an experience of the non-successive and the non-successive would ultimately be something eternal Right, and I think we could associate that too with Lewis's idea of longing of Saint mm -hmm. Sucht, of that sort of yearning for, for another world that we were made for. But I think this activity, again, is difficult for us because of the cultural sort of biases that are against this form of, of reading. And the culture doesn't prize, certainly, the qualities that make for good reading, silence, sustained attention, and so forth. Um, we live in a culture that's very fractured by media, by screens, and, and so forth. And, and you know, we'll definitely have to spend some time working against that if we're going to enter into the way that Lewis asks us to read. And finally, the idea that um, waking up to reality is, is very present in Lewis's book. Um, uh, Jerry mentioned the idea that all reality is iconoclastic. Um, we develop preconceptions and biases and entrenched views that are often false. And so um, we need that, the, the truth of reality to break into that so that these things don't become idols. Um, and I think this kind of, of, of a beneficial iconoclasm that we can engage in that helps to wake us up. And I think Lewis, again, just the idea of, of seeing through new viewpoints and new windows uh, to see the world anew. And Lewis says, um, I think it's in the discarded image. He talks about um, the use of the satisfied imagination. That is, um, the satisfied imagination helps to re-enchant the familiar and the mundane such that those things bring us back to an awareness of and, and worship of God himself. And G.K. Chesterton, again, has just a wonderful story that I think illustrates the satisfied imagination that Lewis is calling us to. And, and I'll close with this story. Um, in the story, there are two boys, uh, Peter and Paul, and they're, they're playing in, a, in the front yard of their, their house. It's a very tiny yard. In fact, Chesterton describes the front yard as no larger than the dinner table. And there's a little strip of grass and a flower bed and a couple of gravel paths there. 
And as they're playing, along comes the milkman, who is actually a fairy in disguise, and he grants the two boys each a wish. And so uh, Paul decides that he wants to be a giant because he's always wanted to see the wonders of the world. And so he strides across the ocean, looks down on the Himalayas, and it reminds him of the rocks in the garden, his house. He strides back across the ocean, looks down on Niagara Falls, and it reminds him of the tap running in the bathtub. His brother Peter, on the other hand, decides to become a pygmy, and at half an inch tall, Chester says suddenly his world is transformed. The front lawn becomes an unimaginably huge and vast plain and a jungle. And it's, he says that it's a world that he'll never come to the end of. And Chesterton has something interesting. He says, if we stare fiercely enough at the facts actually in front of us, we can force them to turn into adventures. And I think that's the satisfied imagination that's being able to re-enchant that familiar to such an extent um, uh, that it just becomes a conduit of, of worship uh, towards God. Chesterton also ends that essay, it's called Tremendous Trifles, with this word, the world will never starve for want of wonders, only for want of wonder. If you want to rekindle wonder, go to these books that people neglect in Lewis, and it will do that for you. Uh, some of them are academic, and some of them might be a little work. But you know, it's like, it's like uh, uh, getting fit. If you're an athlete, you don't just walk out on the field on game day. You have to have some preparation. And so too, we need to cultivate these kinds of habits of study so that we can grow and see the world in a, in a, a, in a much better way. We've got some questions, I think. You sure do. Thank you so much. Um, a really nice set of questions here. So I'll just begin at the top. You both have been immersed in the world of C.S. Lewis for so many years. Um, but this is a question from Julie Dorsey, who says, I'm interested, please, in anything you learned about C.S. Lewis that surprised you in the course of this book journey. You know, I, I, all these books I've read over and over, so I'm, I'm familiar with them. But the reason why Lewis says when you go back, you should go back and read a book over is because we bring more to each reading, mm -hmm. we see more, and so on. And I think that one thing I was really impressed with was seeing once again, the continuity in his thinking. He, he is not a secular person who has compartments for everything. He is a person given to the lordship of God in his life, and consequently, everything relates to everything else. And this book, I think, reinforced that. The, the study of this book reinforced that. Yeah, I was actually going to say the very same thing. Um, he's just the continuity that he provides and, and the, the ideas that appear in one work appearing again and again and again in his work. It just makes it a kind of a delight to read these books because these ideas are constantly reinforced. And so you kind of build this this um, sense of, of what Lewis's ideas are all about as you go through his literature. You know if you see it in his scholarly work, it's going to reappear in his apologetic work or as in his fiction in some way. And so that makes reading him just a great experience. That's great. Thank you. Gail Harlow says, this is more of a comment than a question, but this is fascinating. I've read these books, but I think I need to reread them given the background information you're giving in this seminar. Thank you. I think a lot of us listening to you feel the same way. Well, Gail, I would say one more thing too. Don't just stop with Lewis too. Go and read the books that he refers to. He opens more than wardrobe doors. Yeah. And you start reading some of these other books and they'll take your breath away. Chaucer, uh, Milton, you, you read um, Boethius. He thought it was the most influential book on, on medieval literature after the Bible. I read Boethius, I'd say it's one of the 10 best books I ever read. So go, go ahead and go to those other books as well. Thank you. Um, back when you were talking about the allegory of love, Andrew Pester asked, he says, you mentioned medieval love. Is there any influence of the curious mixture of agape and eros with Abelard and Eloise? Lewis doesn't mention it specifically, but if you want to find out more of what he would think about those things, I would suggest you read The Four Loves. I've read The Four Loves many, many times. I'm actually rereading it right now. And I think you might find that helpful, Andrew. Thank you. Chris Lanier says, 
I suspect that one of the reasons that some of these writings have been neglected by the mainstream is the suspicion that they would be somewhat unapproachable by we who are not literary scholars. Would you characterize your book as one for the layman or the scholar? No, well, first, I, first off, we have to say hi to Chris Lanier. <laughs> He's a dear Lanier. friend of mine. Yeah. You know, um, so to affirm what you're saying, Chris, is yes, they are dense, um, obstruse, often difficult books, but um, totally worth the read. Um, and, and again, this kind of gets back to um, our culture's propensity to to towards the shallow and the quick and so forth. These are books that are gonna take time and attention. They're gonna take rereading, they're gonna take study. I mean, you look at Jerry's copies and my copies of these books, they're underlined, they're highlighted, there's notes in the margins. It's just the, the work of study that goes into reading these. And that's just kind of the reality of, of many of these books. Certainly some of them are more approachable than others. But put it in perspective too, Chris, when I started first grade, Dick and Jane, the primer, primary reader, look to me dense and scholarly because I had not even learned to read yet. I think every year we grow, we should find a degree of awkwardness in us. If you're not awkward someplace in your life, you're not growing. I just don't want to be stuck where I'm at. I want yeah. to keep growing. Fantastic, thank you. Andrew Pester says, some of the discussion seems to hit at the theme of authenticity, a dangerous work in history. How does this affect Lewis? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. I know, I'm not either. Andrew, um, if you're still here, if you want to um, expound on that, we'll come back to you. Um, here's a question by Gail Harlow. In reading the discarded image, were you thinking at all about Michael Ward's Planet Narnia? I think he got a lot of his ideas in Planet Narnia from the discarded image and the poem, The Planets. Absolutely, yeah. It's a fantastic work. If you haven't read it, you should definitely go out and read it. Um, I don't necessarily give it away, but I can kind of tell you that the book, if you haven't read it, um, Michael sort of discovered what he thought was an imaginative secret um, that goes with each of the seven chronicles of Narnia being aligned with the seven planets of the medieval cosmology. And it's a fabulous work. I'd recommend anyone go see it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, go go read it and pick it up. Pick up and, and Michael's book is a brilliant work of original scholarship yeah, really on, on C.S. Lewis. Gail Harlow is back again asking, will you be writing volume two of the neglected C.S. Lewis with more of Lewis schol scholastic writings? I don't know. We, we have to Rachel, hear something from Pericles. Yeah, Rachel, maybe we should that. ask you that question. <laughs> I'll put in a good word. You'll have to ask Rachel, but we did list the eight other neglected C.S. Lewis books in the back of that book. Thank you. All right, let's see. Steph Salazar says about reading, I was told of how to Read a Book by Adler and Van Doren. Have you heard of it? And how do we teach the sure. skill of reading? I, I not only know of Adler's book, I used to meet with Adler for lunch. He was kind of a hero of mine. He was also a big C.S. Lewis fan, by the way, and, and came to faith eventually towards the end of his life. But, but no, um, the, the idea of reading the book, uh, Adler says you have an engagement with the author. That's why when Mark says his margins are all marked up and written. You have a conversation with the author. You don't agree always with everything the author says, but with Lewis, while there are things you may disagree with, you better be on your toes anyway. It's interesting. Adler also wrote a, a very short essay, How to Mark a Book. And he talks about <laughs> how to engage in that conversation. And I thought that meant taking Mark and sticking him in the book. Right, yeah. <laughs> There's Dan Ehrman. I know Dan is a former student of mine. Oh, good. Yes, he says, is there a tension between the plumb line of reality and contorting ourselves to imagine well? Um, I'm not sure if I qu quite understand the question. There's always a tension between the plumb line of reality and my imagination, which has fallen, and my reason, which is finite and fallen. And so consequently, there can be those tensions. The goal would be to somehow adjust the scoliosis of my soul to the plumb line of reality. And I see your next question is from Steve Beebe, who just came out with a brilliant book on C.S. Lewis and the, and the craft of communication. It's a brilliant book. And um, I wouldn't have my doctorate if it wasn't for Steve Beebe. He's one of my doctoral supervisors. He's asking, have you given any thought to writing about the, ne the neglected, neglected books of C.S. Lewis, such as Spirits in Bondage and Dimer? Are there overlooked riches we could find there? 
You just wrote I, about I, I think, Dimer. yes, I've got a book coming out on Dimer in October. It's a book go. that he wrote before he was a Christian. It's the longest narrative poem. He wrote it during the days he hoped to have a career as a poet. And, and um, the, the, the book actually has in germ many of Lewis's questions that he will find the answers to when he comes to faith. And the other thing, um, the Lewis estate has allowed Dimer, Lewis's book, to be published with this book. So it's the first time I'll be able to say I've actually done a book with C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and Spirits and Bondage is, a, is a, a volume of poetry. I think it was Lewis's very first, very first published book, yeah. book um, written before he became a Christian. So it's interesting to read some of his poems in there where he rails against the God of the universe. He was an atheist at that point. And so it gives you a picture of Lewis that you just can't get anywhere else. But he also embellishes the concept of longing. He does, so yeah. He's both, he's, he's both groping for something and shaking his fist at the one that can ultimately satisfy him. It's interesting. Yeah. Here's um, Andrew Pester, who is clarifying his earlier question. He says, authenticity is a booby trap for historians as they struggle to contend with contemporary views in the study of the past. You mentioned your own struggles with this, but does Lewis expound on this at all? You mean historicism? You talked about historicism. I, 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 I'm not sure. Again, Andrew, please forgive me. I'm dense. I need to read more deep Lewis books so my mind will open <laughs> up and I'll get better at these things. Um, I, I, I think, I, I don't know how you're using the word authenticity, so you'll have to forgive me. I mean, certainly Lewis would say, I need to, to get to those old texts as best as I can. And I don't want to represent them inappropriately. So, so anyway, there you go. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's see. Scrolling back up here. Um, Kelly, uh, Nevin Kelly, Brown Kelly. says, I oh, agree. Oh, we were high, we went to high school together. Oh, okay. Good Nevin to says, I agree with the need to avoid chronological cynicism. I think I am mischaracterizing what C.S. Lewis meant. Did he address a related problem? that of filiopietism, worshiping the past, rather than understanding both its strengths and weaknesses when trying to apply its lessons to the present. Well, yeah, Lewis, Lewis believes that every age has, has the need for some discarded images. And so consequently, he's critical of the past. He's not, he's not a, a worshiper of the past, but he's also not a person who turns his back on the past because he's so rooted in contemporary moment that he sees no value of that which preceded him. Mm -hmm. So Lewis seems to have a good balance of these things. William O'Flaherty says, a which of the- William too, he, yeah. he's a really interesting Lewis scholar as well and wrote a book on the misquotable C.S. Lewis. Yes. About the things that people attribute to Lewis, but he never said. Fantastic. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. He's asking, which of the eight books did you grow to love more as the result of writing The Neglected C.S. Lewis? That's a tough question. Whichever one I was reading at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm always a proponent of the discarded image. I've probably read it half a dozen times now. And uh, every time I read it, I get something new out of it. I appreciate them all. Sarah Waters says, thank you for this great talk and indeed the book. Lewis is sometimes being critiqued for being too teacherly or not academic enough. And these books perhaps get less attention by medieval and Renaissance scholars than we might expect. But I was wondering if you think these works have been neglected because of his faith, the teacherliness, or something else. Well, it could be all of those, Sarah. Sarah's also done some good work on Lewis too. Um, I, I, I would have to say, um, that the, these these books sometimes get passed over just because um, people don't appreciate this kind of academic work. Right. But there was a guy named Norman Cantor. He taught at New York University, and he wrote a book called Reimagining the Middle Ages. And he's got the 20 top medieval scholars of the 20th century. And he said, hands down, Lewis and Tolkien were the best. And he says of Lewis's allegory of love, if, if you're an academic and you write a book and nobody reviews it, it's like the kiss of death. A bad review is better than no review because it meant somebody took you seriously. Then you can have good reviews, that's great. But very seldom does somebody write a book and it actually changes the trajectory of that discipline. 
And, and Cantor says, medieval uh, uh, literary critical studies have gone on beyond Lewis, but Lewis is the one who charted the path. And so consequently, they followed his path after that. So it's, it's pretty remarkable, actually. Thank you. Oh, here's our final question from Daniel Whittier. Thank you so much for all your study and teaching. In your research, did you find any additional writing regarded, regarded by C.S. Lewis, excuse me, regarding sex and morality? I believe he regarded purely spiritual vices as worse than animal vices. Um, I think you're right on that. And there are several places where Lewis talks about um, sex and, and, and sex in relationship to literature. He even wrote uh, about T.E. War, I, I mean, um, um, uh, Lawrence's, you know, Lady Chatterley's Lover and stuff like that. And he wrote uh, in sex, sex and Literature and so on. So he does literary critical work on that. But um, he did believe that the spiritual vices are worse than the physical vices. He says the worst sinner of, of all time didn't even have a body. It was Satan, you know, a fallen angel. So he says they could be worse. But the problem is the physical vices, the bodily vices, they, once they become justified and rationalized, then all of a sudden they lead to the spiritual vices. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't give yourself a pass if you say, oh, I struggle. I don't struggle with jealousy and pride and arrogance and anger. I struggle with uh, uh, sexual addictions and so on. Don't worry, it won't be long before you'll have problems with the others. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of our questions and we're at the top of the next hour. So I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you again so much to Jerry and Mark. I think we all feel like we've attended a mini seminar <laughs> and can't wait to dive back into this book again. So really thank you for all your work. Thank you for the passion and dedication that you're bringing to educating all of us. Thank we're you. very grateful. Yeah, it's a privilege to publish this book. So thank it's you. It's so much fun for us to work together too. That's, That's the other true. thing. That's great. <laughs> Um, just to let everyone know again that this whole conversation will be available on YouTube later on for two weeks after tonight. So please um, tell any of your friends who you know were hoping to come but might not have been able to make it to go to YouTube. You can go to the Paraclete Press website to find the link and watch it soon. The Neglected C.S. Lewis and all of the Mount Tabor books are available from your local booksellers and from paracletepress.com. If you order from our website, all of these beautiful books are 20% off right now, so this is a great opportunity to stock up your library. Please consider gifting them to friends and family, your book club, perhaps small groups you might belong to at church or at school. Your generosity will help support our authors and Paraclete Press in our ongoing work, providing um, opportunities to get together like this one tonight and publishing more of these wonderful, wonderful works. I also wanna let you know that through the rest of the summer, Paraclete is hosting a series of online um, day-long retreats on various topics like prayer, poetry, mysticism, spiritual memoir, art and theology with several of our authors. So I invite you to visit paracletepress.com to learn more about those, and we really hope you'll join us. We hope you enjoyed this time together as much as we did. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety, and we'll hope you'll join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of Zoom events is available on our website, paracletepress.com. So thanks again, Jerry and Mark, and God bless everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you.